everyone. How are you doing? Hello, Dr. K. Hi, Ryan. You doing okay? Yep. I'll be right back, okay? Okay, so while we wait for a few more people, actually a lot more people, we are going to download the notes. Um, and maybe the PowerPoint too, okay? Hi, Emmanuel. It's a little windy here in North Marina Valley. Hi, Beethoven. So check out the notes. Hi, Jose. Check out the notes and also the um, PowerPoint slides, we're going to touch a little bit on that. You're going to find most of the answers on that and the notes. So I'll go through the assignments in class today, and then we'll talk about architecture today. And then when you have time later tomorrow or something, check out the lab. If you have Windows PC, you can install um, the LC3 simulator. And if you have iOS or Chromebook, you can use the GitHub online simulator. I put a few links on there for you. Um, it looks similar, but it's not exactly like the, the full interface. So we'll wait one more minute. Okay, six o'clock. Um, also check out, I posted the NASA internship. I mentioned it, if you were in my class yesterday, you probably heard it, but I put it in announcement. I know that the application is due on the 5th of March. Um, <coughs> I think tomorrow they have a webinar on it. So if you like, you can check that out. That's gonna be for summer. I know a lot of companies start posting um, internship for the summer now. So a lot of them are remote too. So you can find out how you can get some experience um, as far as development or even engineering. There are a lot of opportunity for interns right now. So spring's a good time. All right, um, I'm going to go into screen share. We're going to touch on chapter three today in the text. Um, we're going to talk about operators, gates, um, and then we're going to go into state machine and talking about the architecture of the microprocessor. So this week, I added one new page and I'm sorry, I'm a little behind on grading. Usually I would knock out the grade by the second day of the following week. Um, but I'm gonna 
catch up this week. So I will update the rest of your assignment grade. See, I have a lot of things in queue right now. Um, so I added some uh, ARM64 resources for you. So throughout this class or maybe later, you can check out how you can also learn ARM64. Um, originally, I was gonna go this direction and prep for CIS 11 with ARM64, but because it's, it's pertained to specific processor and that's gonna impose some issues, even though if we're using simulator. Um, so, you know, that's something that I can look into down the line. But if you look in the field, this is where a lot of the development is at. And the cool part about this is, um, you know, with ARM64, depending on the version, of course, but you can use, um, you can use Visual Studio or C++ compiler, very much like Microsoft ASM, especially for Windows environment, you can. Um, so for this week, we are going to go over chapter three, okay? Um, look at the notes page. It actually gives you the notes and the publisher presentation. Um, I don't use the PowerPoint too much. I only refer to it in certain chapter um, when it has some of the core components that will pertain to the textbook. Um, and then for the lab, I customize all my lab and the majority of the later lab is going to be parallel to some of the university lab manual. Um, and so, and I will walk you through those. So make sure that we read chapter three this week. We're gonna complete unit two assignment and then we are gonna complete lab two, okay? So the notes, you can find it here. Yes, I added a lot of things. Um, so what I recommend is to look through the documents that's provided. I also provided you with the link for uh, to simulate gates um, in the case if you're going to get into engineering, either electrical or computer engineering, it's helpful to kind of familiarize yourself on, on how to diagram these. Um, what do they mean? How to make a MUX? Um, and, and what is it used for? So we're going to talk a lot about the functionality of it today and what it will look like. Um, but you can experiment with it uh, through a lot of simulator. Long ago when, and when I teach like circuits and things like this and in various ends in computing, um, you don't see a lot of simulator, but of late you would see a lot more resources. So for you guys, I think it's a plus. Um, to really check out the resources and, and prepare yourself for what the industry is looking for. Um, now, if you downloaded the, the PowerPoint, um, you will find that, you know, these are broken down into different sections, but ultimately the publisher released to us the, you know, one chapter PowerPoint, but it's divided um, up into different sections. So you can download those if you want to take, to take a look at them. Uh, it's helpful, okay? And then this one, the LC3 tutorial is for our lab. Um, I also provided another document in the lab portion for the tutorial, the same thing. So I like for you to check out the tutorial before you start doing the lab because it's gonna make a little bit more sense on knowing how to use the simulator, okay? So check that out before next Thursday. I will post the recorded video tonight. Um, we are gonna do this assignment right now. And I like for you to open the notes and the PowerPoint or, or look at the screen when you follow along, okay? So unlike last week, we did a lot of math calculations with the number conversion. This week, we're gonna go more into concepts and then um, and programming in LC3. So um, when you're looking at the assignment um, to start, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my PDF here, okay? And this is provided to us by the publisher, uh, actually a professor that, that used this particular textbook and it's used widely across. So just to start, um, last week we touched on the components of a processor. Um, and 
when you look at a processor, so this is my Ryzen 5. Can you guys see that? Okay, I'm in the small window right now, but um, in the back, what you see is you would see the pins, right? And then you would line the pins from pin one and forward. Um, so the physicality of the processor is, 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 you know, our CPU is mainly small. Um, if you look at some of the legacy processor, um, that could be larger because the technology has changed on how we develop or build these and, and manufacture them. But what really is inside the processor is going to be transistors. Um, and the way that we look at transistors, okay, one second. The closest that you can probably find for MOSFET transistor, it would look something like these, okay? And for our processor, right, uh, physically, these are gonna be very small. And so, and processor doesn't just consist of transistors and microprocessors. So if you're looking at microcontroller and the simplest one that the student would find microcontroller is like the Arduino, um, a processor would also consist of diodes, capacitors, resistors, and sometime conductor. Um, but the majority of the, 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 there are billions of transistors in the modern um, processor, like if you're looking at the Ryzen series from AMD or even the Intel. Um, and <clears throat> every manufacturer will have their own design and their own count in the actual transistor. So um, I showed this a little bit last night, but here you guys can see. And this is a Wikipedia page. So uh, you probably hear my dog drinking water right now, <laughs> sorry. Um, so you would see some of the more recent, right, processors. So for example, if we're looking at like the Apple processor, like the M1 that's in some of their devices, right? And that uses ARM 64. And then some, uh, the majority of the newer ones use ARM 64, like the Apple A13, um, Qualcomm. But if you look at the second column right here, it gives you the, the transistors count that's inside each of the processors. So if we're looking at like the A14, which was produced last year, the amount of transistor is very high compared to if you look at the beginning, right? Like the earlier in the 70s or the 80s, they were only in the thousands because we have larger instruction sets that's gonna be able to handle more computational needs, complex computational needs. Um, so therefore we implemented the technology to be able to accommodate our needs. So this is what you would see. Um, and you, know, you can simply search for transistor count through Google and then find this page. And I also provided the link through the notes, okay, on this on this note page document. <clears throat> so the notes in the presentation actually begins with talking about a circuit, okay, and on the simplest level, we we can think of our light in the house. Um, we can think about how uh, our our circuit will work. Okay. or when you're using a flashlight. So <clears throat> if, if there's no current through the circuit that would have no signal that would be off, and so your V out is gonna be 2.9 volt. Um, when the switch is closed, when this is closed, okay, when it, it flip closed here, it's gonna have a short circuit where you're gonna have a flow, right? Think of it like a, a loop. And so that's gonna turn on the light bulb where you would have a V out of zero volt, okay? So this is designed as a switch-based circuit. 
um, and it would represent in different states on or off. Well, last week we were working with binary, right? We said that zero is off and one is on. Or sometime it will be open and closed. Okay, you saw the state here that's open. And then when we have the short circuit that would give it a flow that will be closed. Voltage or no voltage. So roughly we're gonna see about positive 2.9 volt right when the switch is open and when it's closed we're going to get a zero volt so to answer the first question going back to our transistors and what it's used for and then going into our second question if you think about a processor or even a microprocessor it is an integrated circuit which consists of transistors diodes capacitors, resistors, and inductor, okay? Now, if you ever wanted to know what would, these would look like, you can, of course, Google it, but if you have a desktop PC or um, if you, if you're looking at, if you're looking at like a, a motherboard, um, you would find like a round tubing that will be for the capacitors. And then resistors, if you're ever working with circuits with Arduino, you would see they are, they look like needle. And so they would have different, um, different, uh, I wanna say different level of resistors. So resistors allow us to regulate the flow. Um, if you have, you know, a higher level resistors, you would reduce the flow. When you have a lower level resistor, you would increase the flow um, when you have that circuit built. So all of these components are inside the actual processor, right? And the, the transistors, its job is really, it's used, its functionality is for gates. So like what we talked about is it's a it's switch, okay? It, they call this flip-flops. And gates are used to make combination circuits. And in, in, in while flip-flops are used to make sequential circuits. And we're gonna revisit these two terms down the line, okay? So gates are used to make combination circuits and flip-flops are used to make sequential circuits. Now, these are used to make different building block of your microprocessor, like the ALU, which is the arithmetic, right, part of the processor. Arithmetic logic unit, it, it does a computation where the CU, the control unit does, it direct, it, it coordinates, it tells like, you know, um, you know, especially when you have flags and cues, for hardware, that's the CU job. The ALU is for calculation, okay? And then we have storage component, which is memory too, inside the actual processor, but that is also incorporating some gates, but less, okay? So this gives you the overall picture of what is inside the processor and how gates are used. And earlier you saw on the presentation on that slide, it, it tells you the state, zero for off and one for on, or sometime it will refer to open or closed, voltage or no voltage. So when we have off, we have no voltage. When we have on, we have voltage and you know, for the sake of this class, we would refer to that as 2.9, positive 2.9 volts. Any questions so far? Now you don't have to write it out like I did. I just wanted to make sure that it gives you the overall understanding. So you can use your assignments as, you know, review notes and things like that. Um, for the future classes, for your own 
purposes and for exam and quizzes. So it depends on how you, you can just simply put down, you know, what Gates does, okay. All right, so before we go to the different type of MOS transistors, uh, do you have any question for me? Okay, so um, to, and the book gives you, you know, explanations of what this would look like, right? So in the case where if you imagine that you would have a power supply and that power supply would allow us to give the power to the light bulb. So in a closed circuit, um, in a closed circuit, right? Like what we referred to earlier right here, you would get zero and in an open circuit, you would receive the volts, right? It opens and you would receive the volts that would give you a, it switch open, that will give you an, uh, I'm sorry, when it, the light is off, that's gonna be 2.9 volt. And when it's closed, you would get zero closed circuit and it's on. So in the, the, the MOS transistor, MOS stands for metal oxide semiconductor. And in the notes, it tells you what a semiconductor is. Okay. So the reference in this text, it talks about the MOS transistor. That's a type of transistor. And simply it's, it's semiconductor. Um, so now these P and N type, they complement each other. So the way that it's physically set up is that they create a layer that's gonna be like, think, think of it like sandwich, the way that the book referred to it as a sandwich and it's created by silicon, okay? So hence the term Silicon Valley for tech companies because we use proper processor, right? And the layer of silicon dioxide and a layer of metal, which creates the metal oxide semiconductor. My mother who is retired now, she used to work for a semiconductor company and they still operate in Orange County. They build wafers for different companies that produce hardware devices from memory to um, motherboard to, um, you know, uh, some board of, on hard drives uh, and flash drives, etc. And then you got companies in China, of course. So American made, you do have some company that's still producing semiconductors here. Okay. Okay, so the notes on page two, it talks about what, how the layers are, what it consists of, how it's physically created. Um, and silicone dioxide, the, why they use it is because it insulates well, okay? And it's very thin. So in quality management from what my mother told me is that that was her job was to look at you know, the wafers as they produce them and making sure that, you know, it, they, they check for like thickness and consistency. So it, my, at microscopic level, um, they would use like these scopes to be able to determine if it's qualified to, to actually send out to other manufacturer that's going to produce these hardware devices. Okay. So this gives you some explanation on what is it made of, right? These gates and how it's used with integrated circuits or our processor. Okay, any question? So for a MOSFET and the way it's diagram is like this. So there are components to the gates. The elements are source strain, 
And so what you would see in the later explanation is that it would, it talks about the transistor would have three regions and that pertains to the MOSFET, source, gate, and drain. So gate is part of the transistor. And so important thing to think about with, with how the electrical charge works is that when you have a current flow, it's gonna go from the source to the drain, depending on the charge. And what, what happened in the drain region is that it says that it's doped with different type of material than the region under the gate. So it just consists of different material. So it, you're gonna have a flow between the source and the train, drain region, okay? And this is what it looks like with the P and the N. And now, so if we go to our second question, it asks you, what is the difference between the N type and the P type for the MOS? And it would get a little bit clearer on the slide four of the deck. So we talked about metal oxide semiconductor. And within this, we would, in, in the transistor, we would have N type and the P type. So when the gate receives positive voltage, what will happen is it's gonna close this and you have a circuit, okay? So when it receives the volt, it's gonna have a close where you would have um, you would have a short circuit. Now, then if you, if you, if the gate receives a zero voltage, it's going to open between terminal one and terminal two, then the circuit is considered open when it gets a zero. Okay. So think about our true table and what we've done last Thursday, right? and how this would apply to the physical component that is represented as our gate. Okay. So then for the terminal two with the end type, this is connected to ground where the P type is gonna connect to volts to, to positive. Okay, so here is my altogether answer. So it gives you the details. So I put that the end type, the gate has positive voltage, short circuits between terminal one and two, which causes the switch to close. When the gate has zero voltage, circuit is open between terminal one and two causing the switch to open. It is attached to ground and pulls output voltage down when the input is one, okay? Because ultimately when we see this from a programming perspective, right? Um, we see this with wool, we see this with, you know, using the operators this is physically what's happening inside your processor. So with the end type, it's attached to ground, which is zero, and it pulls output down when it receives, when the input is one. So when you introduce, when you have external input as one, right, it's gonna give you a lower voltage. And for the P type, it's the opposite. It's a complementary of the N. So they work hand in hand. When the gate has positive voltage, circuit is open between terminal one and two. When gate has zero voltage, short circuit between terminal one and two causing the switch to close. 
and the p-type is attached to positive voltage. It pulls output voltage up when the input is zero. Okay, any question? So, actually, where can I find the PowerPoint again? You can find the PowerPoint on the notes page. Okay, thank you. Yep. If you go back a couple of pages from the assignment, you can find here. Okay. Let me see if I put everything. Yeah, in the part one, it, like on the third, on the slide four and four, you will find that. Okay, so you find it on slide four and five. Okay, so the diagram shows you this here. And with the P-type, you have, it's attached to the positive volts, nine volt, oh, 2.9 volts. And so it will be open, right? And then when it receives a zero, it's gonna close. I'll leave this on for a little bit so you guys can take a look at what, and I simply just took the information from the slide and put that there. So you can find that on the first slide deck on the notes page. Question? Okay, so let's take a look at the next question. So last week we worked with binary and the next question asks you what are the voltage ranges for zero and one in digital logic structures, okay? So let's refer to this and also our notes. So here uh, on the following slide, which is slide six with the PowerPoint, it talks about switch behavior from, for MOS transistors and gates are implemented for logical functions and or and not, right? We worked on this last week. So now the representation with the digital value zero that's gonna be approximate analog values between zero to 0 0.5 volts. As I mentioned before, right? It will be somewhere in this range with analog. And for the one, the digital one, what you would have is between 2.4 to 2.9 volts. And we would refer to this as analog voltage for the digital logic symbol. However, if you look below, it talks about the assignment of voltage range depends on the electrical property of the transistors that is being used. So in our case, when we're looking at the, the for this course, right, we would refer to 2.9, positive 2.9 volts but as the statement before, it talks about, it really is the property of the transistor type. So sometimes you would see this as 3.3 volts, positive 3.3 volts or positive five volts. If you ever work with Arduino or Raspberry Pi, it uses the other two, positive five volts or positive 3.3 volts. 
So when you're looking at component sets in the computer that mechanically drives, right, like like uh, rotates and things like that, uh, DVDs, player or burner, um, uh, hard drive, right, that requires suspended disk. Right, itself, those type of devices utilize on its own 12 volts, okay? So when you're referring to the power supply for your desktop, right, you see these different type of wire that would be connected for specific, for that's gonna go to specific connector that will go to components like drives, um, motherboard and processor and so forth, right? Um, and each of the, the connector would have different wire and color coded. Ground, right? They would have orange or yellow, red, black, etc. And all of each of the wire represents different voltage that would be utilized for the connector when you connect that. Okay, so on electrical level, we would utilize the power supply to convert our house electricity, right? And so that way it would be distributing to all the components, including your processor inside your laptop or your desktop. Now, if you're, if you're working with microprocessor like Arduino or even, you know, advanced like Raspberry Pi or other type of boards, right? They would utilize 3.3 or five volts for various area or functionality for, you know, if you're building circuits to do different things like drive motors, et cetera. Okay. Now I know that um, it's regulated roughly. I know Arduino, it doesn't go over seven volts. So top is about five plus. Okay. So here is a little bit more information that you can also include. Now, CMOS stands for Complementary uh, Metal Oxide Semiconductor. And if you ever work with, if you build computers or when you look at motherboard, right? Motherboard has uh, a CMOS chip that's dedicated for what, anybody know? You, well, you're in computer science, you're gonna find out more about what you're using, right? Because ultimately you're writing program for how to be able to operate these components. I see a chat answer, is that an answer? Yes, thank you, Eric. BIOS information or your setup information and what that does is what? To really recognize what kind of hardware you have, okay? In, in your system, like drives, memory, CPU, uh, you know, graphic cards, you name it, okay? So complement, complementary metal oxide semiconductor also use N-type and P-type. And same, you know, information as what we would see before, okay? So here is where we left off last time with operators. When we're using NOT, we talked about how to apply NOT with the two complements, okay? So now when you're looking at the in and the out for NOT, so when we, introduce, when we have zero volts, it's gonna output 2.9 volt. When we have a 2.9 volt, it's gonna output zero volt. It's the opposite. So when you look at the truth table, it's zero and then it's gonna output one. In is one, it's gonna output zero. And on circuit level, it's gonna look like this. So the P is here and the N is here. So when you have an N of zero, the P is gonna close, the N's gonna open and it's gonna output one. Now, if you have an input that's one, the P is gonna open, the N is gonna close, and it's gonna output zero. And this is the not gate, okay? For the NOR gate, which is not OR, 
it's an or with the not. So you do see P and N in combination here. But in this case, we have to have two input. Not is the only operator that has a urinary input. Uh, so when input is one, does that mean that there is voltage input? Yes. So when you have an input of one, there is. Are you referring to the not, right? Then it outputs zero. And so in the case of not or, you have a zero, you, you would have a zero nor one, right? Then it's gonna output. So when we have zero, zero input, no voltage, we would have a one as the output. And later on, we will touch on the Morgan's law. Okay, so here's the truth table for not or gate. And then the OR gate, okay, which is the opposite of not OR, nor. So let's go through and identify our gates, okay. Now, the diagram that you see on the PowerPoint. Okay, it can be drawn that way, or a lot of the times you would see it be drawn this way. Okay, you have two input, the A and the B, and then you're gonna have one output. So depending on, it's either zero or one here for the A and B, and this is why we look at the truth table, right? I mentioned that with the and, anytime that it has a zero, it's a zero. So for the first one, A, that's gonna be the N. And the way I remember this is N, the N, the word N has the D and the shape looks like the D here. Okay. So for quiz and exam, make sure we can identify different gates. The next one is gonna be the OR and it looks like an arrow shape. So for the the not or hey, Professor, do you mind scrolling up real quick? I didn't get to catch for the digital zero part. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh -huh. So for the or, it looks like the arrow shape and we would have input A, B, could be zero or one, right? And then we would have one output. So and requires two input or requires two input. They both produce one output. And then for the knot, it would look like a triangular shape, but you would see a bubble like this that would represent the knot operator or gate. So C is knot and D is not or or nor. So we have an or with a bubble, right? So that means it's not or. So if you use the gate simulator link that I put in the in the notes section you will find that it's drawn like this and you can play with, you know, and it has tutorial on how you can build multiplexer, right? How to be able to draw simple gates. Any question with these?
Oh, Professor? Yes. <clears throat> um, so for like the NOR and for these last three, including the NAND, mm -hmm. would it have the, the line over the A and B? Yeah, so the A and B just represent that it's going to be one output. The true difference between the NOR and the OR is the NOR has this small bubble right here that represents the NOT. So when you look at NOT, right, it's drawn mm -hmm. like this. So instead of drawing the triangular and the arrow shape, what they did was they combined it. So you have an OR in the front and then the NOT. So that would be the exact process on how you would find the output is you OR the values together and then you flip the value. Okay, you knot it. Got it. Mm -hmm. And the so for same, A and B, uh -huh. they just have like the two lines connecting into the... the yeah, thing. so the two line represent two input, right? You have, when you look at the true table, you have to have two input for the and operator, the or, or operator, mm -hmm. okay? Not only has one input, it requires a one input. Mm -hmm. So A and B just represent values, right? Either zero or one, mm -hmm. zero or one. But when you, when you have the output, it's gonna be a single output, only one output. So when you have a zero and zero, it's gonna give you a zero, right? When you have a uh, zero or one, it's gonna give you a one. So you have to have two input for these, except for the not. You only have one input and you're gonna get one output. For the not or, we talked about that. And then for the an or the nan, which is not an, it's strong with an an and the not. So when input is one, does that mean uh, is not, not is also called the inverter? Yes. And yes. <laughs> it sometimes referred to a complement of, like, so I can say that this, this is the inverter of an, is nan. It's also equivalent to or. We'll talk about De Morgan. Okay. So for tests and quiz, you might be given a few of these and you have to distinguish them, which one they are. So the arrow shape like this, right? You would see that that's an or, if you see a small bubble attached to it, that will be not or. The D shape is gonna be and, and if you see the attached bubble to it, that's gonna be not and. Question. Okay, so let's go back to here, right? It provides you with the true table and then the diagram here show you how the P type and the N type and what the N is the inverter of NAN or the NAN is the inverter of N. Okay. And on slide 13, you will find all of them together, okay? So if you wanna review, you can take a look at that slide. So with the De Morgan's law, it allows us to convert and to or right? And we would implement the not, the not and is going to be equivalent to or. So there are two parts to the De Morgan's law in relation to and or and not logic. 
I put the detailed stuff, but you can summarize it if you wish. So the first theorem proves that when two or more input that are an and negated nan and negated, so that will be nan, that will be equivalent to or of the complements individual variable. So the equivalent of the NAN function will be the negative OR function. Okay, so with the first theorem, the equivalent of the NAN function will be the negative OR function. Now, alternately for the second theorem, two or more variables nor together is the same as two variable inverted and an. So that will be not an. While the second theorem states that two or more variables nan together is the same as two terms inverted, complemented and or. Okay, so we can replace all the OR operators with the AND operator and vice versa. So when you have them nor together, it will be the same as the NAN, that's the output based on the second theorem. Okay, so if you look at the diagram right below that, I added that. So you have the N, right? When you NAND it, it's the same as not or. And I'll leave that on here for a little bit. I know that some of you like to type out everything exact, but you don't these have two, to. You can you can summarize it. Oh, these two variables that we're talking into A and B, right? So the yep. and the one. Yes, that's correct. A and B. So you can just simply type this. Right. Oops, sorry. or type the last part of it. Yeah, you don't have the second part of the picture on the file. I only put it there just to illustrate to you what it would look like in diagram. You don't have to put the picture. Just type out the answer so you can use that for reference later. And of course you can always draw the circuit. What is the, by negative or, which is not or, negate or. It's the inverse of or. Okay, so the question was, what is the, ne the negative or, that was just the negate or or nor. So when you invert the two terms, based on this, when they explain this, if you flip the bits, 
that's not right and then you or them together so it's just the opposite and then you or So ultimately, from the second part of the theorem, we can say that we would replace the OR operators with the AND operator and the AND operator with the OR operator, okay? Based on the proof with the, the NOT logic gate. Question. Okay, let's move on because we still got like more than half to go. So here in brief, the slide doesn't give you too much detail on that. I actually wrote that out. So it's a little bit clearer for you. But the slides summarize what it's, what our answer intends to say, right? Converting and to or using, you know, using not with the proof. So to convert and to or, you would invert the inputs and the output, which is not or and not and. Okay, as you see, it's wrong with the not here. So you invert the inputs and then you invert the output. You can test it. Right, check out the truth table here and you can look at the values. I'm sorry. Okay, so, um, So in the case where if we have more than, if we have more than two inputs, right? In the case of where we would have a third input, we would also use two input gates would be the same with the single CMOS circuit like this. So we would have ABC and then we would end this together. And then after we have the output, then we end the output with the C to have ABC as one with our final output, okay? Remember what I said from the first week, handle two input at a time, right? Okay. So this gives you a little bit of summary on what we just talked about. Let's look at the next part of our assignment. This is when we're gonna do our exercises. So there's a little bit of the, the not and. So now if you need to manually do this without the true table, what you would start is you would start with the and first, and then after you have the output, you flip the bits. Okay, so I'm gonna do it that way. So I don't have to refer to the actual true table every time. So the first step is to get these to and together. So what you can do is you can have, so one and zero is gonna be zero. Zero and one is gonna be zero. One and zero is gonna be zero zero and one is gonna be zero, one and one is gonna be one, okay? One and zero is gonna be zero, one and one is gonna be one, and zero and one is going to be zero. So this is the first step, okay? I'm gonna change the font real quick. Then our second step is we're gonna go ahead and apply not to this.
Okay, and that's going to give us, we're going to flip the bits. So it's going to be one, 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 zero, one, zero, one. So in the, for the operations for NAND, we end the inputs, then we flip the bits or we, uh, we apply the not logic gate. Hey, Professor. Um, sure. In assembly terms, you said uh, so the NAND, we're adding the bits, and then for the NOT, we're flipping the bits, right? No, for the NAND, you AND the bits and then you NOT it. So there are two steps. First, you AND them together, not add. Add is a different thing, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, you and them. So the, the operator, so last week we spent a little bit of time working on the true table. So with the and rule, anytime that you have any, any input that's a zero, you get a zero output. Okay, so once I have the result from the and, then, then the final step is to not it to give me the output for an and. Okay. okay. So I'm going to separate it a little bit so you it doesn't confuse you. So this, this final answer here is going to be for, oops. Hey, Professor, is it because NAN is basically the AND and the NOT? Yes. That okay. is what I was trying to tell you. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can try B, right? We end them and then not it, or you can refer to the truth table and get your answer. But on the test, there will be no truth table. Okay, so work on B and then I'll go over C. So for C, just like what we did with the NAN, this time we're gonna do or and then not it. Okay. So our first step would be, I'll be copy this. And we're gonna or it first. So what we have is, when we or one or one is going to give us a one. Okay. Zero or one is going to give us a one because or rule is that any input that has a one, you're going to have a one as the output. Zero or zero is zero. Zero or one is one. One or zero is one. One or zero is one. One or one is one. And one or one is one. Yeah, you can type out the answer for B right below it. You don't you don't need to post the answer in the chat. Just type it in your You can if you would like to share with other people, but let them work for their answer. <laughs> okay. Then once you have the or, just like what we did with the and, go ahead and nod it. 
So once you or, then you nod it to get you the nor. So after this, what we would do is we would flip the, the output from or. Okay, so zero, zero, one, zero, 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 zero. There's five ones, right? Yep. So this is the answer for C. And I wrote it out so you can see the step to be clear. But yes, you can use your calculator for this. Click bitwise and then the operators, the, the logic gates are there. The logical operators, you can use those buttons. Question. So to clarify, if there is a one or zero, the result is yes. So with or any time that any input you have a one, you're gonna get an output one. With the and, anytime you have a zero, you have the zero output. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay. So if you understand how this do C, you can go ahead and also, I think I will give you another one, do D. Same step, right? Or it and a not. Okay. Question. Let's talk about exclusive or. Okay, so Hey, Professor, for D, I got all ones. I didn't know that's when I ordered. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. right, sure. Yep. That's fine. All the bits are on, right? It filled that byte. And then sometime you have overflow where it flows into the next byte. Okay, so when you're looking at logic gates, you can have a combinational logic circuit, okay? And combinational logic circuit really depends on the current input, it's stateless, it's present, right? What is the current input? And the output is gonna be that, okay? Um, the sequential logic circuit it depends on the sequence of input, past and present. And it stores the information as state, which is from the past input. And this is gonna lead us later on into state machine, okay? So with the combinational logic, it's different that it, it depends on the current input to get the output. The sequential logic, it's gonna, depend on past and present input. It stores the state from the past input. Okay, so let's look at some example with these. So a decoder, okay? Um, here it shows you an example of how you would use a decoder. Now we know that when we write our program, right? our computer 
right? Through the compiler, it takes your program. It needs to first it fetch it and then it decodes it and then it executes it, right? So the, in the decoding part, what it does, it needs to do what? Convert everything down to zero and ones level. And the same thing with your smartphone and everything else that you use that is a com computer system, right? Your, your laptop, your smartphone, everything, because the processor does that. So decoder, in this case, what it does is it's going to look at the one input that's going to be one for each of the possible input patterns. It's one, 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 okay? And then it's gonna decode it. So if A, B is zero, then it's gonna have one because here we have a not and, see that? This is a not and gate. Then also here, when you have input as zero, one, it's gonna give you a one. You will gonna have a not on one of the input in this case, we have not on both of the input. Okay, we inverted both of the input and we end it. Okay, so if you inverted zero and zero, you're gonna have a one and a one and you end one and one together, you get a one. Okay. So this is what, this these gates are being used for like a two bit decoder. And we use a lot of different type or different size decoder, okay? Even in the text that we use to display that's encoded with, you know, with some form of encoding and then the computer has to take that and decode it. So what you have is you have an example of the combination that would be your decoder. Now, sometime you would hear the term MUX or a multiplexer. And in this case, it shows you the drawing for the MUX. So you would have like a selector that will be two to the end input, and then you're gonna have one output. Okay, so this is a binary form input, and then you wouldn't have the output as one value. Okay, so for example, A, is going to be select 0, 0, B is 0, 1, C is 1, 0, and D is 1, 1, okay? And then it's going to output only one value because it applies these logic gates, okay? So first it's going to invert the two input, the two selector here, which is 0, 0. So we're going to have, that's going to flip to be one and one, it's gonna and it, it's gonna get a value. Same thing for B, C, and D, it's gonna invert one input and it, get a value. So after it gets the four value here, then it's gonna or it together to get a one output, okay? So a multiplexer is a group of logic gates that's combined. And in this case, we have four and, right? With the or. Okay. This is not a nan because what we don't have a bubble after the and. It just simply inverted the two input only and it kept the A the same. So, this is a four to one multiplexer, okay? So engineering, you're gonna do this. <laughs> this is gonna be, this is gonna, especially in electrical engineer, right? So while it's four to one, right? It's obvious there is four logic gates and then it's gonna give you one output through one gate. Okay. Now, last week we learned about binary addition. You remember when you do a one add with the one, you have a zero with the carry, right? So when you look at this line, when you have a one add with the one, you have a zero carry in, 
that's a, that's your zero carry in. And then you're going to have a carry out, you're going to bring care one to the next column. So you have one carry out. So on this line, it shows you on how that one is carry out and our, our answer, our output for our selector is going to be zero. Okay. So to implement that at the gate level, this is what a full adder would look like. Okay, just to carry that one to the next column. So we can operate arithmetic with you in, in computation and ultimately your processor it computes, it calculates, it's a big calculator, right? All it does is it adds, that's the only thing it's gonna do, okay? When you multiply, it adds. When you add, it adds. When you, you know, divide, right? It is subtraction is part of division. And so when you do subtraction, it adds the, the two complement and so forth. Okay, so you can get the idea. So in the case where if you do a full adder, it has what? Two, four, six, seven, right? Seven to two mux. Okay. All right, let's, so now I spent a little bit more time with you guys explaining this this year compared to last year, I kind of rushed through it. So I wanted to touch on it and make sure that you see it. Um, so it makes sense to you when you're using, you know, these logic in the future. Okay, so the purpose of a decoder, it is a circuit that changes code into a set of signals. It is called a decoder because it does the reverse of the encoding. So ultimately know that it is a circuits, combinational circuit that changes into signal. So you need to convert it. So let's talk about your smartphone, okay? When you, take your phone and you call your friend or your girlfriend, boyfriend, you know, family, loved ones, etc. Your voice comes in as analog signal waves. Okay. Your phone is built with, a, with, it takes that analog, which is sound wave, it's going to convert it right? And it's going to encode it as zero and ones. So when you're, when you talk, that signal is not going to be transferred from your smartphone to the cell tower to the destination as analog signal, right? It's going to be transferred as digital signal because we use digital networks, okay? Then when it gets to the recipient smartphone, it's gonna convert it back to the analog signal so they can hear, okay? And this is built with the system so that way you can see in the form of a decoder and the reverse of the encoder, okay? Any question? Okay, good. All right, let's move to the next part. We still have a lot of time, so I want to take time. And okay, so we touch on multiplexer. And just to summarize that, right? Uh, the purpose of the multiplexer in logic functions, multiplexers are what we call MUCs. They are either digital circuits that are made of high speed logic gates that use to switch digital or binary data. And they can be analog types using transistors like what I told you guys about your smartphone and when you use your smartphone to call people. MOSFET or relays to switch one of the voltage to the current input through the single output. So you're only going to get a single output where it's going to combine 
Think about that. Combine a group of logic gates. Okay. And it's so that way it's going to relay the switch of the voltage with multiple inputs to give you the one output. I saw in the discussion that some of you are, are going to go into electrical engineering, and this is going to be the area that uh, this is going to be your thing. Okay. So to really understand how each of the component work with computing system, you have to have at least the basic level in knowledge in electronics. And so that's why you would have courses that will emphasize some of that. Okay. So this is giving you the overall architectural concept. And I hope it's going to gel all together. So when you think about how the system works, right, why are you writing certain things in your program, how that's going to be, you know, um, translated at the machine level. Now you see. Okay, earlier I touched on the adder. And I'm a little wordy here, but you can summarize it. Yes, and you will have a digital digital class in the upper division at university level as well, especially for engineering, even computer science, you have to take one, some form of digital class. So those, you know, things that you learn in physics is going to apply. Everything that you touch on from every part of, you know, the undergrad portion, the lower division, it's going to come back to the upper classes. Okay, all gonna have, you know, it's all gonna make sense. So for question 10, it asks you to explain the purpose of the binary adder, the full adder in digital logic structures. So a binary adders are arithmetic circuits. Okay, there are two format. One is gonna be the half adder and a full adder. You saw the, the, the diagram on how the full adder would look like. This is used to add together binary digits. And we only care about adding because the computer, the processor only adds, okay? Combinational logic circuit, which can be constructed using just a few basic logic gates, allowing it to add together two or more binary numbers, okay? like a one added with a one, a zero added with a zero, but the adder allow us to do the carry in and the carry out. So when you have a one added with a one, you can carry a zero in and carry the one to the next column, carry it out to the next column. The basic binary adder circuit can be made of standard and and exclusive OR gates. Okay, this is when XOR comes in allowing us to add together two single binary numbers, A and B, okay? So when I taught um, bachelor level, like upper division cryptography classes, I have to come back to the concept of logic because, um, you know, there are, there is technology that we use to stuff bits, okay? So, in, in order to avoid like, you know, man in the middle attack and things like that, they implemented technology when, when data is sent because data is raw, right? It's digital. Um, we can use technology right before it's sent to actually inject or stuff the bits. And it used logic gates or logic, logical operator, you know, to add in the bits. Um, there, you know, when you read more into different, you know, technology, even with like, um, you know, cryptocurrency, stuff like that on how they build that, right? Um, you know, like blockchaining, how it's able to look at the block and how it's chained it, the, when in, in the sequence. At the low level, look for information about logic gates and it, you're going to see some, you know, it's all going to gel together and say, oh, okay, I understand how that's built with the circuit and how that will be in the form of programming. Okay, so um, basic binary adder, like we said, it's gonna use the AND 
with the exclusive OR gates, which allows us to add two single bit binary numbers for our input A and B. Question. Okay, so let's touch on, here it is, I see some chat question. Let me look at that real quick. All right, so here is a diagram for the four bit adder. Okay, how earlier we saw how it carries in and it carries out. So this gives you like a little diagram on how it would be with the AB input. And then um, for the combination and with the or, so we have two and here, right? It inverted the A and the C. And then on this one, it inverted the B. And so you would then get the input here and then or it, okay? So the logical completeness of any true table with and, or, and not, okay? Illustrated through multiplexer. All right, combinational circuit coming back to this. Earlier we said that it's gonna give the same it's, it's going to take the current input, right? And it's, gonna, it's stateless. With the sequential circuit, it cares about the past and the present. So it needs to store information. There got to be storage in that, okay? Because whatever happened, it's also going to store it. And then currently what's happening now, it's going to use both, okay? So it has to have a state. Um, and so for a combinational circuit, it's always going to give the same output for the given set of input because it's exactly as what the current, the, the current input would be. So output is the same as input. Now the example of this is adder would always generate the sum and carry regardless of the previous inputs. Okay, so when we go through and we did the addition, what we see is the, the adder, its functionality is always going to carry, okay, regardless. With the sequential, it's going to store what happened up to that point and the current, and output will depend on the state, okay, plus the present, which is the input. So any given input might produce different outputs. So that can change depending on the input. So if the example that they use here is your ticket counter, if you push the button, right, it output depends on the previous state. It would use what was stored and the state of that machine. So let me give you the big, so I put down the, the same information that you would see on the slide. But a good example for combinational and sequential circuits, right, is if you're looking at two forms of lock, I think I put this in my notes. One is gonna be like, button that you press to open a safe, okay? So if I, I put in one, two, three, four, and if it's incorrect, it's not gonna open, right? If I put in the right number combination, two, three, four, five, let's say, and it opens. So that will be combinational circuit. The sequential circuit would be, you know, those, um, those rotational locker, where you turn left and you turn right. So you have to go left three times and, or go left and then put the number, go right, put a number. So there's sequence in the action. It cares about the first step, the second step and the third step, right? So that will be a sequential circuit. 
like the locker at the gym. You turn it left, you turn it right, and then you turn it left again. Okay, that will be a sequential circuit. So it remembers what you did for the left, what you did for the right, and then the last right, or the last left, I'm sorry. Wait, professor, so it's like the safe too, like the ones they have at the bank? Like how yes, often? right. Because in, in, in any of the sequence that you get wrong, it won't open, right? The, if the first step is wrong, it's not gonna open. If your second, if your second, if you turn right and if you didn't put the right number, it's not gonna, it's not gonna open. And it needs to have that sequence, otherwise it doesn't work. If you turn right three times, it's not gonna work. So <laughs> yeah. So when you think about combinational and sequential circuit, think about that. Okay, that's So for memory implementation, like RAM, what you see is you would see this being implemented, sequential circuit and some combination, okay? So, so if you want the details for that answer, refer to slide 23 in the slide deck. Um, you know, I think that's further down the line now, but let me, let me get to the notes part right here. Okay, so I added some details on that. Oh, I'll, I'll come back to this. I gotta touch on this with you guys. A multiplexer, adder. Okay, adder information is also there. It talks about half adder and full adder. Refer to the notes. So the exclusive OR gates is drawn like this. It's the OR with the strike. Uh, I don't have, I thought I did, maybe it's on the slide. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to this real quick, okay? This was, this was um, part of the not logic, right? So this is an example where it shows that first we need to have a location, right? Which is an address, a storage location then we would have data input, okay? So in the not case where you would have data, you, you introduce one, zero, it's gonna take that and store that at zero and then it's gonna flip it, okay? Where if we have a one, then it's gonna store the one and then it's gonna flip it. So when you work with assembly, think about that. Right, we start with the memory address location. We're gonna assign a value to the register or we're gonna first clear it because we don't know what state it's in because register handles different things. Sorry, my dog gets a little crazy. Um, and then after that, what we're gonna do is we are gonna use, we might have to not it, right? In the case when we not it, it's just gonna change, right, that, it's gonna flip that bit. It's gonna give you the opposite, okay? So, um, now the next part, it's gonna talk about RS latch in the storage element. So in storage implementation, storage implementation, um, if you read further into it, it's it's a little bit more complex than this, but if we're referring into storage in, for the processor, we would say that, you know, R would be used to reset and then, or to clear the element. So in assembly, when you clear it out, right, you can use a certain logic gate. We're gonna touch on this. And, and you know, either this class or, I mean, this lab or in a future lab, I'm pretty sure we're gonna to touch on it in a couple of weeks, or we can simply assign it as a zero. So when you reset or you clear, you just zero it out, you null it out, right? 
then if you have the s slash that's where we we're going to set so think about like the higher level programming language right like for c plus plus you have a variable right you declare the variable int variable one okay semicolon then if you assign it as a zero, it's just gonna store zero, right? Nothing. Then you would say int variable one equals zero, have an assignment. So what happens is you create a memory location and right now has no value, just zero, okay? But when you wanted to set a value, right? Let's say that you reassign that, you would say variable one, equal, right, 120. At this point, it takes the, the decimal 120, convert it to binary and introduce the value or store that in at the memory location where that for that variable, right? So in the back, what you have is it's either set or reset, okay? So if A is gonna be one here and B is zero, okay, where it resets. So if you have, if you your data is one and if you tell it to reset, it's gonna null it out, okay? But if you have the, if you start with zero and if you set it, it's gonna put a one there, okay? And this is at the very bit, small bit level, right? But earlier our example is in the scale of a higher level. So you can take a look at the diagram and look at how A and B is used. So when you set, okay, and then when you reset. So when you clear it, you set it to zero. And we're gonna come back to this when we start doing programming with assembly. So the example that you can also see is on page 25. If you start with the output one, then change R to zero. When you reset, that's gonna be zero. So since it's stored a value with the Python state, what happens is it's it stores it from one and then it's going to reset it to zero and then at that point the state will be zero after it's reset okay so there's some of the summary with the rs latch so r and s if we start with one that's gonna hold the current value in the latch. Then we, if we wanted to set the value to one, then we would have S as zero and R as one. If we wanted to set the, the value to zero, we would have R as zero and S as one, okay? So in addition, you know, for storage, we also have to think about the D-latch and the write enable. So write enable also store the previous value, which allows us to determine the state or the system determine the state. Okay. Registers, in this class, register is very important. So in, in this sense, right, register can store values and we would use it and it's a temporary storage, okay? Remember what earlier at the beginning, I mentioned that the processor consists of registers, transistors, right? Uh, and so, what you would have is for the register, it can store multi-bit value. And we would use D latch and write enable. 
So in this class for LC3, you have eight registers to work with, zero through seven. Okay, and the word size, the length of it, you, it's 16 bit. Now, if you look at like the ARM64, its length is 64 bit, word size 64, much larger, more modern, right? So at the simplest level, this is what it would look like with the logic gates. Okay. So like I mentioned in our class, we are using word length with as 16 bits, okay? And the way that we denote this is the bit zero, which is the first bit, is the least significant bit, it's on the right-hand side. And the most significant bit is on the left-hand side. The way that we write it, the way that we read it, it's going to be left to right and we use the colon to denote. So in this one, all it's saying is that it's going to be from the 14 to the 9 bit and this is the value. Okay, this is the value for, for the 14 to the 9th bit. And this is the binary value from bit two to bit zero. Okay. So next. Sorry, I should have highlighted this. For question 12, you can put down the RS latch is a simple storage element. R is used for reset or clear, which is set to zero. S is used to set the element to one. Any question? For the representation with the multi-bit representation, how we denote this, for A, right? So we start with bit zero here, go all the way to the front, that's bit 15. So we're gonna go from 15, right? Count it backward, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11 and 10. So we're going to go from 15 to 10. And this is the value. For quiz and final exam, make sure that you know this. Because later on, when you start looking at different operands, it's going to refer to the location in that word length which bit it's going to take the position of a certain bit to represent a certain operand, okay? And then when you use like uh, values, right? Like a decimal number or a hexadecimal number, it's going to use a certain bit to store that for in the register. For B, this one is easy, right? If you have bit zero is here, you're gonna go zero, one, two, three, four, and five. So that will be five to zero from left to right. And then the values, which is the highlighted. And you can do C. And the answer for C in the document.
So count from the left to right, right? Starting with bit 15 from the left and then count it down 14. So we're only gonna care about the highlighted part of that word. So 10 to four. Mm -hmm. And then put down the value. 10 to four equal. So in the technicality, right? You can put the square brace like this. I should do that. So proper denotation. So basically we're saying that this is an array of bits, right? Starting at this position to this position, think of like an array and the index of it, right? And then the values that are, that stores there. Any question with 13 or 12? So may you also ask um, for us to denote the bit from uh, right to left or no? Uh, for the quiz and the test, you're going to have it multiple choice. So it's going to give you something like this, and it's going to ask you to pick the answer for the denotation for multi-bit. Mm -hmm. So it's always left to right? Yes. When you denote multi-bit representation, yes. Oh, okay. But the remember, like the least significant bit is on the right, which is zero. And then the most significant bit is on the left, which is the 15 for the word size. Mm -hmm. And you can also find this on the slides. The reason why I didn't upload this PDF that I have is, um, it doesn't have, the picture doesn't have alt text and we have to make sure that it's past the accessibility checker. So with the PowerPoint, I was able to edit it because, you know, um, this one was from way back. So I edited the PowerPoint pieces and then I, I re-uploaded it. So it passed the checker. So on slide 30, you also see some instruction for this. This is just a convention on how to denote it for the multi-bit representation. And for this class, remember that our word size is 16 bit, okay? Okay, uh, with memory. So in assembly, we would see that we can use an array to store string values, right? Starting with this lab, you're gonna see how you would set up, right? An array of memory and then you can put in string because uh, if you think about, you know, from the programming classes, when you put in, you know, string as a type, what is, what's the size of that type, right? And remember, we're using word size, so we have to chunk it in increments of, you know, your word. So how many words is it going to take to store this particular string? So what we can do is we can take a look at this, and it's going to give us the overall picture of how that would be with the array of memory. Okay. So with the logical K times M array that would store the number of bits. So that will be the address space is the number of locations and it is two to the power of N. Now the addressability is gonna be the number of bits per location, hence bytes. So for a word that's 16 bit, how many bytes is that? 8 bit is a is a byte 16 bits is 2 bytes yes so it's going to be multiple of 2 so in each of the location it can store 2 bytes per word okay so if i need to store 
let's say 32 bits, how many words do I need? Okay, so think about that, right? So when you work with the assembly, you have to manually select location and then point out on how it would set up that array of memory to store, you know, values. So this is going to be the number of bits per location on how the addressability and then the space, the number of locations. So, uh, you know, we can have M times K where K is two to the N. So the example that they use is this word select, word enable for the input bits. So the addresses, we wanted to tell it right enable. It's gonna have an address decoder and then it's gonna output the bits. So this is two to the second times three for the memory. But in, S in LC3, it's easier. You can, you can actually look at the address location as the increment. And then in addition to that, you can tell it like how many words you wanna use for that. And I'll explain it when we do the lab. Okay. Okay, next. So let me touch on, okay, uh, real quick on memory, okay? So memory is implemented with less transistors. Uh, it's gonna be more dense. So when you're looking at like memory card chips on the memory card and there's some electrical properties requirement for things like RAM. Um, with the logical structure, it needs to have these elements. Address decoder, like what you've seen in the previous slide, okay? You would have an address decoder. You have to have it right enable, right? And then for your word size on how you would be able to select because it's gonna need to jump um, and for that array. So what you have is you have these elements, word select, write enable for the word. And depending on the architecture, you would you would have some time word length on the newer one, like I said, 64 bit compared to if we're using something that's older, 16 bit. Um, for some, you know, some of the older Intel, we would have it as um, 16 bit or 32 bit. So the two main type of RAM, random access memory, uh, I'm sorry, random, yeah, random access memory, you have the static RAM, which is used for processor. It's fast, it maintains data uh, as long as power is supplied. So you need to give it power to retain the data. Dynamic RAM, which is used for your regular, you know, DDR4 RAM chip, that would be slower, denser, um, and even on the VRAM, your video RAM, that's dynamic RAM. Um, and it must be periodically refreshed. So it needs to have the power cycle that, you know, so when it gets low, it needs to refresh it with the power cycle. Otherwise it's, it's gonna lose the data. So um, now, all of these, both of these are volatile, meaning that it requires power. And for the ones that don't is when you see ROM or PROM or EEPROM. And that is often used to store firmware and, you know, basic instruction for that particular hardware. So state machine. Um, earlier, we touched a little bit on sequential, right, logic circuits. We touched a little bit on state compared to stateless and combinational circuits. So a state machine is a type of sequential circuit. It also combines with combina combinational logic with the storage. It remembers the state and changes output based in addition with, so it uses input and the state to change the output. But 
we wanted to get to. So here is what I was talking about earlier, combinational versus sequential. Okay, combination lock, right? We have a safe where we press the button. If we press the wrong button, it won't open. That's combinational. In sequential, we have go left, go right, rotation with the right number. A state is basically a snapshot of the relevant elements of the system at that moment in time when that snapshot is taken. And you see this with virtual machine nowadays, you see this with your system, right? When you're doing backup, you're creating a snapshot or an image of that system at that point in time. So from that point out, if let's say you download a bunch of files, you modify your configuration, you change, right? You, you, it stores all of that changes. So, and then it's gonna tr transition to a different state. There's some example there with basketball game. And uh, so I don't wanna touch on this because we already talked about that. So here's the diagram, okay on how it would transition between the states. So states and action cause a transition between the states. Like I said earlier, think about like how the computer that you're using, right? If you download a malware, okay, that's an action. And then along with the existing state that it's operating, and then it's gonna impact that and transition to, to a different state. So for the finite machine, it consists of finite number of states and finite number of external inputs along with outputs. It is an explicit specification of all state transition and explicit specification of what determines each external output value. You can include all of that. So basically, hence input trigger state transitions. Outputs are associated with each state and input. Okay. So I just combine that for my answer. Finite number of states consists of finite number of external inputs and output. It has ex explicit specification of all state transitions. Question. Sorry, let me bring it down. There you go. I also put the outputs are associated with each state, with each transition combinational logic is used to determine the outputs for the next stage or the next state. The state transition at each clock cycle and state representation is maintained in the storage. That was what I added along with the slide. So you can see. So for, and if you look at the next few slide, it talks about clock cycle and clock cycle is used to for state transitions and it's store each state because it's using it explicitly to determine the output value. Okay. Any questions? I will try to push this video online about 9, 10 ish. It depends on how fast YouTube will respond for two hours video. It takes a little bit for it to convert, but it will be on tonight.
in case you need to go back and look at some of the details. But go through the notes and the chapter that's going to help you. Um, no question on this? Okay. So before class, I kind of gone through and put together the arm list for you. And I was looking, um, there's some information about using, uh, you know, if you have a Raspberry Pi, you can look at some tutorial to be able to use Raspberry Pi with ARM for assembly if you wanted to expand. But a lot of the uh, use for this is if you wanted to program ARM 64-bit, Arch Linux is your friend, okay? <laughs> I just converted my Python networking class to use uh, Linux because they have to test it um, using Linux virtual machines. But so here you can see that if you read a lot of the documentation and it depends on the version too, right? Uh, ARM V8 is a little bit different than V7. So there are different revisions. So make sure that you take a look at those. But um, so the, the V8 and the V7 is used with like Cortex. Um, if you're familiar with like Snapdragon processor, um, that's in like your Android, uh, you know, HTC phones, uh, Samsung phones, smartphones, et cetera. Qualcomm produced Snapdragon. Um, so, you know, they're always looking for developer to, to do stuff. And then you can also find work with Apple doing ARM64 programming. So there are a lot of different stuff outside of the higher languages if you look at like the, the assembly level. But that kind of gives you some idea. So I link these web pages to the page for you. And, um, you know, with that said, that, that concludes my session for today. Type in your name in the chat. Um, thank you very much for attending. I will try to update your grade, hopefully by Friday. And then, um, See you on Thursday for the lab. Check out the lab information, please. And then we will work on it together. Okay. Have a good night. Take care. Uh, professor? Yes. Do you have, uh, I have, actually have a couple of questions. Do you have time? Sure. Uh, I, I had trouble under, actually understanding like the whole, um, like, problem 13, like I was kind of, I was pretty confused understanding like what to do. One second. So when you look at problem 13, like for example, A, right? This is a word, which is 16 bit. That's just given to you. And it highlighted the first five bits. And it asks you to use multi-bit representation to denote it. So you're going to start from the left-hand side, which is bit number 15, OK? Because on the right, that will be 0. On the left, that will be 15, OK? So we're going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, count it up to 15. So, and when we denote it, you write it from left to right. So we're gonna start. So that's why I put 15, which is the first one here. And then we're gonna go to the 10th bit because that's the highlighted section, right? And that highlighted section takes up five bits from bit 15 to bit 10 in a word. And its value is are those zero and ones. I guess I guess I got kind of confused because you said, well, you said five, but I I see there's six like ones and zeros. Oh, did I? Oh, I'm sorry. Fifteen. Yeah, six. I'm sorry, six. Oh, so okay. you're gonna go from fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, twelve, eleven, ten. Okay. So you oh, just okay. count it down, and then put down the bit location starting from 15, which is the left to the last one there oh. at the end of the highlight. Uh -huh. and you, do, 
Yeah, and you do the same thing on this one too, okay? okay. And this one, I count it from zero to the zero and then I count up, but when you write it, it's gonna be from left to right, from high to low. Okay, and you just, you just copy down what, what belongs yeah. to that group. Right, so basically you're saying this value occupies those bits. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I got it. Thank okay. you. Okay, you're welcome. Other questions? Oh, um, actually, um, I forgot to submit the the introduction thing. Is it okay to still? Yeah, you can go back and post it. I think I still open it for. Let me double check right now. I think a little it's longer. Replies now. Let me see. You can still reply. Um, one second. I'm going to look right now for the discussion. Are you referring to the discussion from last week? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can still go back. I just got to check the due date for you and make sure that I didn't lock it after the first week. Um, yeah, that was due on the 22nd. And then I have it available. They change up our interface a little bit. Yeah, it's open until March 15th, but do it as soon as possible. Okay, I'll do okay. it. Right All right, All right. You. you're welcome. Bye. Uh, other, my other questions? Good night. See you Thursday.